assured that it will sell for somewhere in that range. So therefore, when I tell my clients the value, I would say it's somewhere between 130 and 134. And that is how we do comparative market analysis. That's how the appraiser does CMAs. They are looking for all of these matching areas. <clears throat> yeah. when, uh, when you use a CMA, how far back um, are you Good supposed question. to go with that? Rule of thumb is this, one mile and six months sold. Now here, it's a rule of thumb. It is not an absolute law because you may find, like I said, you've got issues and here's a couple. Um, let's do it this way. White River like runs through Indianapolis, all right? And you get over here to Talbot Street right here and then Talbot Street jumps over White River. They've got houses here now, $400,000. If you go over the river, it may be a $10,000 house just because of the way the neighborhood is. So while the rule of the thumb says, oh, well, I want to pull a CMA on this house, I can go one mile radius. This is where your intelligence, your experience, all of this has got to play out to go, well, yeah, I know I can go a mile, but I certainly can get these up here because of the neighborhood is different. These are more of the renovated newer homes. These still haven't been renovated, so they really don't substitute for it. Sure, I'll, I will use all of these homes, you know, there's three or four over here, but this river has been a deciding factor. Um, what is the one Fletcher Place across to Hallville? You may not be able to do that, even though technically it's within a mile. You've got little pockets of area. Um, Broad Ripple, well, you certainly can't go eight or 10 blocks south of Broad Ripple because it's a different market. So while the rule of thumb is one mile, you have to understand that in some cases, maybe your one mile is like this. You've got to flow because you can't go over the river or you can't go past that street or you can't go into whatever. Same thing with six months. Six months is how far back you can look. So you start here and go backwards six months. Those are all the properties you would use. If the market has been pretty solid or stable over the last year, hey, maybe I'm gonna go back one year. Should have made that 12 months. You get my point. You know, market's been pretty stable. I'm gonna have to go back 12 months. That's why the art is required. It's not a science. You can't say point blank, this, 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 and this. Okay? But what you're looking for is that. Now, the problem that you get is this. And let me take a second here to manipulate this. That's 2.5 baths. Let's say this one is 1,200 square feet. And this one is four bedrooms. So you've got to list this property. And here's where I was talking about, about the art coming in. So now you've got some property and this is the first one, as you can see there, is a three bedroom, two and a half bath. So if my subject property is inferior, if my subject property is inferior 
to the cub. What do I mean by inferior? It's, it's missing something. Very good. It is worse, missing something. It's of lower value, however you want to look at it. But in this particular case, my subject value property only has two bedrooms. The comp sold for has two and a half bedrooms at 130. Well, if someone bought a three bedroom, two and a half at 130, how much would a three bedroom, two bath go for? Less than 130, right? So if my comp, if my subject is inferior to the comp, I have to lower the value of the comp. So I'm going to lower the value. How much do I lower it by? The value of whatever the uh, two and a half bath will cost. Exactly. And this is where I have told you many, many times. Your license allows you to sell from Jeffersonville to Fort Wayne. Your intelligence should not. Because how much is half a bath worth? Well, a half a bath in Speedway is different than a half a bath in Wanamaker or Fishers or Center Grove or any of those. So let's just make up this game and say it's worth $5,000. So that means it should be 125 because I took the half a bath off to match my subject. It's now 125. Now in the second particular case, this comp is inferior or my subject is superior to this property because it's only 1200 square feet and mine's 1500. So I've got to raise the value of the comp 300 square feet. What's that mean? Well, let's say we're going to raise it to 135, $3,000. And this one, number three, I got to lower it by one whole bedroom. I'm going to lower it by $5,000. So now I've got this new value is somewhere between 125 and 135. Everybody see how I adjusted the comps? I believe there's a question that talks about this one being superior or inferior. And I drew two examples. My subject property is inferior to this one, so we lowered the price. It is superior to this one, so we raised the value. At first, a lot of people intuitively think it's backwards, but the way you need to ask yourself the question is, if they paid 132,000 for a 1,200 square foot house, Mine's bigger, so they're going to pay more than 132. That value would go up. If they paid 132 for 1200, how much would they pay for 1500? More than 132. So it's got to go up. Right? The cost approach. The second way the appraiser is going to deal with property is through this thing called the cost approach. Let me get this right in here. This deals with the cost to build the property. Now, the thing that you need to understand is we are subtracting out the value of the land. So we are only talking about the value of the structure. We are only going to talk about the value of the structure. Mm. 
trying to make these so they, they can be seen better. And when you deal with that, we may deal with this thing called depreciation. I know that there is a question or two about depreciation. Depreciation is the loss in value. And it's figured through this thing called a straight line. And the straight line, see if I can do this. Because it declines the same amount all of the time. And the easy way to figure it is you take the, the value divided by the years. So if this property was worth 135, and it had an economic life, that is key. Of 20 years, I just made that up. They will give that to you. So my question to you is how much is the depreciation on this property? It's the cost or the value divided by the economic law. So is it 6750? Is that how we 6750? That's what I got. 6750. Yeah, me too. So what that's telling you is every year the economic value declines by $6,750. So after 10 years, you would have lost $67,500, right? After 10 years, subtract that from that number there. Uh, the, the value of your house is now 77,500. Would that be 67? 67,500. There is probably a math problem on there that deals with this valuation. And then when you are done and you get that valuation, 67,500, you would add the value of the land back into it to get the value of the real property. I just made that 2000 up for this example. So let's do a math question. If we are going to use the cost method and we're gonna figure in depreciation, if I tell you that the property is worth 450,000, and 100,000 of that is the value of land. My question to you is, if this property has an economic life, economic, of 40 years, what's the value at five years from now. $450,000 real property. 100,000 is valued as the land. If it has an economic life of 40 years, What's the value of this real property in five years from now?
493,750. Well, with the I got four, uh, 43,750. Was it not supposed to? Well, together, I think you guys might have been looking at each other's paper because one of you got that number added to the other person. First of all, it's depreciation. It's not going to be greater than we started with. Mm -hmm. All right. So these are some hints you should probably be looking at when you're dealing with the test question. The value is not going to be greater. We're dealing with depreciation here, which means mm -hmm. loss in value. So anything over 450 is definitely a wrong answer. Mm -hmm. Five years is really not close enough to 40 to make it only be worth 43,000. So that number seems awful low to me without doing the math. Now, somewhere in between there, I think you guys may have gotten the right idea. So someone else, does anyone else have a number before we go through? Yeah, is it 253,750? Yeah. 253,750. I'll buy, I'll bite into that. I haven't done the math yet, but I kind of like it. So tell me how you did that. I subtracted the land value from the property value. Right. Then I took that value and divided it by the 40 years. Then right. I times that by the five years. Okay. Slow and down. Then I subtract slow down. You're right. I just want to do the, so 350 divided by 40. What number is that? Um, what? what was the depreciation per year? 8,700. I had 7,250 per year. Oh, you know what? I think I see an error that I made, maybe. Well, no, maybe well, not. The error I made is I probably did the problem myself to, to verify. You are on the right broad. Everything you've said so far is on the right track. You got to subtract the value of the land out, so that gives us three fifty for the house. All right. Well, I was then a, you would divide it by the two, economic life. I get maybe I, eighty-seven. Did I have the land value wrong? Right. I did. Don't I you? I had one sixty for the land value, so I was at two ninety for the property. Oh, is that because you can't read what I wrote? I can't read what you wrote. What is the land value? Hundred thousand. Oh, it looked like 160,000 with the list. I'm sorry. Release. Okay. My bad. That's all right. I'll fix it. This is my pen. This, this is what I, so I got fat <laughs> fingers. So okay, it actually, well, my intent was to do 100,000. So while your answer may not have been right because of my mistake, I, your process is exactly correct. You get okay. the depreciation per year. And then I ask you five years from now, so you'd multiply that by five. 306,250. So you got $43,750. That is the amount of depreciation. That's what I said. I didn't say you were wrong. I'm at 306,250. So now you would then subtract that from the 350 though. And get your house at 306 to 50. But don't forget, you got to add your land, land back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. You got to put the land back in. Okay. Well, the answer is 406250. for this specific problem is 406 to 50. Okay. So my bad for proper improper penmanship, but let's go through it again. Four fifty minus the one hundred thousand for the value gives you a value of a house of three fifty. You then divide it by what I told you was the economic life to get the depreciation per year. We then multiplied that by the number of years to get the total depreciation that has occurred over those number of years. You would subtract that number from the value of your structure to get a new value of your structure, but then you have to add the land back in to get the current 
value at 406,250. You can get guaranteed there is a math question on there that deals with depreciation. So let me ask you another question, which I know is on there. If the appraiser is calculating the depreciation of a property, which one of the three methods of valuation is he using? Remember, there are three mm -hmm. methods. There's the, the sales comparison, there's the cost, and then there's the income approach. If he's using cost. depreciation, which cost. method is he using? Cost. The cost. That is a question that someone told me. Depreciation is only used in this method. This doesn't use depreciation. This uses income. This one uses past sales. This one uses the cost and depreciation of an item. So watch for that method. If they ask you something about if he's calculating the cap rate, which method is he using? He's using the income method. It's only used in that method. Are we good? Can you name the three methods again? I'm sorry. I don't sure, know if I... Sure. Right here they are. The three methods that they would use to calculate a value. The sales comparison approach. What type of properties would he use on this? Commercial. These are all, well, not all residential. These are the ones where we use history, mm -hmm. right? For the sales? The sales comparison approach. We look at the comps. This is what we just did. And I told you six months back. Okay, sales. So when he's doing the sales comparison approach, he's using the history method or he's using the history of a property by going and looking for what it's sold for. This is the first method that he's got. The second method is the cost approach. And these are houses with no history, like new build homes. Okay. We cannot look up what homes like this sold for because it's brand new. So we use the cost to build another property as well. Well, if it costs Darren $10 to buy his car, what's it gonna be to cost to buy my car? Well, mine's got bigger tires, he's got a bigger engine. So that's how we would do it and then go, okay, well, his is a million, mine's 1.1 because we're looking at the cost to build that product because there is no history to look at. And then the third approach is the income. And this is based on properties solely where the income is determining the value, like investment property. I think it's very imperative you guys understand these three methods and which ones they're used for and why you would use them so that you know when they ask you a question, well, if an investor wanted to know the value of his property, which one of these would he use? What do you think? An investor? An investor wanted to know the value of his property. I would say the cost of property. Can you repeat the question? 
Definitely. Yeah. It's going to be the income if, he's, if it's an investor. Wanted to know the value of his property. Which one of these methods would he probably use? Income. 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 are used on investment grade property because it's so the value is based upon the income it generates not other properties when you go and look at the market let, let's use an example if you are going to buy greenwood mall how many malls do you think there are around here that you could pull comps on None. So you wouldn't use the sales brooch. You would use the fact that on Mar pays rent and Hot Topic pays rent, and that's where the value comes from. If I was going to build a brand new house with uh, Ron Wampler in a brand new addition, there is no history there. I would probably use the cost approach. How much did it cost to build a similar home over there? Well, then based upon that cost, I can figure my cost and determine the value. But if I 90% of the homes want to determine I'm going to sell my house, well, there are probably all around me all kinds of houses that have sold recently. I can look them up on the MLS and do a historical search of what they sell for. That is the sales comparison approach. So please understand there are three approaches, the sales, the cost, and the income. They are used independently of each other. Now, you could occasionally argue, well, I've got a house that I lease out as a rental. Yeah. But mostly residential homes with a history are going to use the sales comparison approach. Brand new homes with no history, cost. Investors are going to use the income. And we really need to do some math and calculate some of the income. So let's go over to here. I mean, would a vacant lot be considered? Income? Vacant lot it depends on no, because it's not generating income. So it will be you would probably a vacant lot would use the sales comparison approach. Okay. I, I have a question. Sure. Um, what if what if you were dealing with farmland and crops where you have X acres that can produce X crop? Is that too theoretical to come up with a value, or if there's a history? of crops and the value of those crops? That, that is an example is it depends on what you're going to do with the farm. First of all, okay. remember, are crops personal property or real property? Uh, per personal? They're personal property. <laughs> they would go with okay. the farmer. So are you buying it to farm or are you buying it to invest? And they actually have that, this is where the term sharecropper comes from. One person would own the property, the other person would actually work the property, and they split or share the crop. So if you were buying it and saying, hey, I'm going to buy this 80 acres of farmland, but I don't have the equipment, but my neighbor who farms his 20 acres beside me is going to go ahead and do mine as well, we're going to share crop it. I get some money because I own it. He gets some money because he works it. I have a question about the whole sharecropping thing. Um, Cause I understand what you're saying about sharecropping. Let's say this.